Hey there, welcome back to another review, this time of the 2017 horror film, The Void. Now, this is a film that a lot of people are talking about it, saying it's one of the best horror films in recent years. And on one hand, I can see why. On another hand, though, I can't see why. And I'll get to that soon enough. But before I get into this review, I want to make this point abundantly clear. I do not hate The Void. I do not even think it's a bad film. I liked it okay. At the end of the day, I would say I, I thought it was an alright movie. Uh, but I definitely didn't fall in love with it with like a lot of other critics did. And I would definitely say... I wouldn't even say personally say this film is in the same league as Carpenter's Prince of Darkness or In the Mouth of Madness or other films that have this type of uh, plot line. Event Horizon, Hellraiser. Uh, it's not in that upper echelon with those films. But for a crowdfunded project that costs $82,000, for it to just be an okay, decent time at the movies, that's pretty impressive because there's a lot of films that have low budgets like this and are crowdfunded that are this type of film and they fall flat on every level and I don't feel that this film did that it actually did have a lot of elements of, to it that I thought really worked really well it just had one had a couple big elements a couple big working parts that in my opinion just did not work as well as they should have and ultimately prevented the film from firing on all cylinders but that's just my personal opinion and uh, if you end up loving this film or if you've already seen it and you love it that's awesome that means this world is an interesting place and I know I sound like a broken record when I say that but I want to make that clear because I love different opinions I'm glad they exist because the last thing I'd want is for this world to be boring there have people who aren't really that interested in things you know I wouldn't necessarily people it's not the right way to word it but I definitely don't want people to have the same opinion on everything because then, then it's boring then it's not interesting so The Void it's a 2017 horror film uh, directed by Stephen Kostansky and Jeremy Galepsi the direction here is actually quite impressive the two really do a great job with their visuals, uh, with how they set up things. Um, I would say there are some things that they could have gotten a little bit better at, uh, mainly hiding the fact that they have a low budget, but there are other elements, there are other things about their direction that is so impressive to me, like how they shot the practical effects. These two guys clearly know how to shoot the practical effects and hide them in the shadows or set them up in ways to maximize their impact. Which is something that Alec Gillis and Tom Woodruff Jr. for some reason were unable to do with their direction for Harbinger Down. Which they were saying in the Kickstarter campaigns, this is going to be the movie to showcase that practical effects are here to stay and and they're some they they should be used and all of that and yeah uh that film was not the movie to do that the void though definitely is uh if there's one thing about this film that i love it's the practical effects it's the practical creature effects in this movie they're some of the best i've seen in a film in a long time they look like something straight out of the 80s something that Rob Bottin would come up with or some of those other uh, makeup, effect, makeup effects gurus. Uh, makeup, effects, uh, makeup effects gurus of the 80s. So that is a definite highlight uh, with this film. And the direction is good too because they, they know how to set up their shots. They, it's visually impressive. The, the, they know how to... Uh, move the camera around to do pan outs and pan ins and zoom ins and zoom outs and all of that stuff from a technical standpoint these two directors definitely know their stuff 
It stars Aaron Poole, who plays Daniel Carter, who is the lead uh, in the film. I personally thought he stuck talk dick, to be perfectly honest. I know it's blunt, but it's exactly how I felt, felt about this character and about this actor. He had no charisma. He had all the charisma of a piece of driftwood. He didn't really have that much to his character. He was this cop who seemed way out of his own league. And there were times where he was supposed to be intimidating or trying to be intimidating, but it wasn't believable in the slightest. It just came across to me as completely inauthentic. And I really feel this lead was one of the weakest parts of the film. Because I just didn't buy him in his role. Uh, I wasn't interested in him making it out alive. I would, wasn't interested in his plight. I, could, I did not give a shit about this character. And he's the lead. And what sucks is it's a male lead in a horror film, which is something I've been wanting to see again. And I get it. And it's this underwhelming lead who doesn't have any charisma, doesn't have any really much of a character to him. Uh, and it just sucks. You have this bland, boring male lead. And, if, and really, this film needed somebody like a McCready, like Kurt Russell in The Thing, or uh, Michael Bean. Michael Bean would have been perfect for this role because he would have a commanding presence, something that Aaron Poole absolutely does not have. He does not have a commanding presence. So, and I honestly liked uh, the actress who played his wife more than him. I thought she had more charisma. I thought she was a stronger character. And I honestly, I honestly thought... She, she should have been the lead. I wish she was the lead and they pulled a blob remake on the audience and maybe killed off the guy who you think is going to be the lead and then it's her who's the lead. Because she doesn't seem like the typical final girl to me. She's a nurse who's a no-nonsense nurse who does have charisma and a personality, but she can also get shit done. That's what I really would have liked to have seen. Normally, I'm not the guy who's like, oh, I want a final girl again. But in this film, I really do think she would have been better uh, as the lead than a Aaron Poole. But that's just my personal opinion. You also have Kenneth Welsh, who plays Dr. Richard Powell. You have uh, Daniel Fathers, who plays the father, uh, and a character named Vincent. Excuse me. He, he was one of the few uh, members of the cast that I thought had showed a lot of potential. I mean, if you're not going to have Allison be the lead, then maybe have him be the lead. Because I liked his character. He was brash. He was kind of a bully. But he also was a character that could believably kick some ass. Who you, you really could see as a guy who could carry a film. Kathleen Monroe plays Allison Frazier. She's that. She's the character I was mentioning earlier that I thought was really strong. Uh, Ellen Wong plays Kim. She's there. She's all right. She's kind of bitchy, but she's there. Uh, Mick Biscoff plays the son Simon. Uh, he's the son of Vincent. He's mute because of some events that he saw. Uh, Grace Monroe plays Maggie. You have Evan Stern who plays James. Uh, James Millington plays a character named Ben. Art Hindle is in this as a in a brief role as Mitchell. Uh, Stephanie Belding plays Beverly, and you also have Matt Kennedy as Cliff Robertson. Majority of the cast, though, is Daniel Carter, uh, played by Aaron Poole. So Aaron Poole, uh, Kenneth Welsh as the doctor, Richard Powell, uh, Daniel Fathers, Kathleen Monroe, Ellen Wong, uh, Mick Biscoff, and uh, but he's the, he's the main, those, that's the main cast for this movie. Now, and the supporting cast, honestly, is one of the most impressive ones I've seen with a film like this. They all have their different quirks. They all have their different personality traits. I honestly found them to be more likable than uh, the lead, uh, Daniel Carter. This film also features a score by Blitz Berlin, Joseph Murray, Menela Music, and Lodewick Voss, Voss, and... Uh, that's another really strong suit that this film has going for it. A great atmospheric movie score that reminds me of John Carpenter or Alan Howarth. Um, I was already a fan of Blitz Berlin because I heard their work in a film called Extraterrestrial. So when I saw their name in the opening credits 
And I was like, oh, cool. I know the score is going to be good because these guys know what they're doing. Uh, and they actually create some good music as well. I like the song that they did for Extraterrestrial. Um, the film also features cinematography by Sammy Anaya. Anaya. Really impressive cinematography. The way that certain shots are done at night. The sequences where you see these uh, mysterious uh, people wearing these white shrouds with uh, black triangles in the center of their faces is very eerie and uh, definitely does remind you of something you might see in Prince of Darkness or something like that. And the other way, other ways that the cinematographer was able to get the most out of a location and also, which is this sort of abandoned hospital, and also how the cinematographer and the directors work together to shoot the effect sequences are also really well done, especially uh, near the climax when there's a sequence where all these reanimated corpses are coming to life and it's all done in this red lighting. And that was particularly impressive to me because it was, it looked like you're seeing a glimpse of hell. It looked like something you might see in a cutscene from the video game Dead Space. It was very effective. And very chilling and freaky and unsettling and definitely one of the more most memorable scenes in the entire film. Uh, it's also edited really well by uh, Cam McLaughlin. Uh, the film is... I mean, all these technical aspects of the movie are noteworthy. They're great. I can't really find anything wrong with this film from a technical standpoint, uh, from a directing standpoint, from uh, an editing standpoint, from the score, from the effects. Uh, the directing, like I said, there's only a few things like they could they could have hid the budget a little bit better, but that comes with experience. These guys have directed a few things before, like short films for their Astron Six production company. They did a movie called Manborg. But that movie was intentionally meant to look as cheap as possible, but mainly because they didn't have that much money. So they didn't really have to worry about trying to make Manborg look like a, a bigger budgeted independent production. Uh, but this is a film where they had, they were definitely trying to do that. And, and there were a lot of moments where they succeeded, where the film looked as good from a production standpoint as independent films that I've seen that I've had twice or three times this film's budget, but in other times there were moments where it definitely did look like it was an $82,000 film. Um, now, this is where I'm going to go into spoilers, and I don't want to ruin the rest of the film for anybody who hasn't seen it yet. So that's why I'm warning everybody ahead of time, uh, because this is a film that a lot of horror fans I know are honestly looking forward to, and I don't want to ruin it for you. So uh, when I get to the spoilers, I'm going to let you know it's coming very soon, and uh, you can fast forward through that and check out the rest of the review, or you can just uh, check it out later. That's fine with me. But uh, if you want my general thoughts on it before I get into the spoilers... Because I have to go into spoilers in order to really get some stuff off my chest in regards to this film. Because I can't really discuss it without doing that. So, if you want my final thoughts on it right here, right now. Like I said earlier, I thought it was okay. I thought it was a decent film. I would say it's a time waster for me, for the effects, for the concept, for, for the idea of a mashup of... Assault on Precinct 13 with Prince of Darkness or The Thing. I mean, that really, that's a really cool idea. And uh, there are some really amazing sequences in regards to the practical effects. And there are some genuinely creepy, eerie moments in the film. So, But it's not a film I'm going to rush to buy immediately. It's not a movie I'm going to run out and try to add to my collection as soon as possible. Uh, it's not one of my favorites. It's not, I would not say it's one of the best horror films I've seen in the past 10 or 15 years. Uh, it's one of the better ones, 
Uh, there are definitely worse films out there than The Void, but I've all personally. I also have seen from and I, I've seen better uh, from my perspective. This is just my opinion, but it's not bad. It's not shitty. It, it, there really isn't a lot of ranting here. Uh, it's not really a rant. It's just a film that admittedly was disappointing. I kind of expected a little bit more from it, uh, but overall, it's worth it's worth a watch. Check it out. Um, definitely, if you are at all curious about it and you want to see some great old school practical effects and gore. Now, we're getting into the spoilers because I'm going to go through the film's plot synopsis and uh, talk about some scenes that I liked uh, and talk about some scenes that I didn't and overall kind of explain to you guys why ultimately I found this film to be just an okay average movie. So the film starts out with uh, this drug drug fiend uh, named James who flees from a far farmhouse and escapes into the woods. A screaming woman tries to follow. There's a junkie. She tries to follow the junkie, but she is shot and set on fire by Vincent and his son Simon. We don't really know who they are just yet. The movie opens up with a bang, grabs you right by the jugular, and you're by the, with this sequence, and you're automatically invested. I know I was. I was like, holy fuck, what the fuck is this? This woman's running around screaming. She gets shot by these guys. She gets lit on fire. That's one hell of a way to open your movie. That's definitely how you grab an audience. Deputy Daniel Carter finds James crawling in the road and takes him to a hospital, where his estranged wife, Allison, works as a nurse. At the hospital is Dr. Richard Powell, Nurse Beverly, intern Kin, Kim, pregnant girl Maggie, her grandfather Ben, and patient Cliff. Daniel discovers an entranced Beverly murdering Cliff with her skin removed from her face, which is a very unnerving sequence. Uh, the way that the director shot the scene was superb, uh, just showing the the nurse just stabbing this guy in the eye w with what looks like not a single care on her face. No fucks are given here. And uh, definitely reminded me of Prince of Darkness, because there's a similar uh, types of sequences in that film. Beverly moves towards Daniel, who he ends up shooting her dead in self-defense. He then collapses due to some kind of seizure and he experiences a strange vision of these clouds and it looks like a heart beating and, and all this kind of trippy shit. While everyone struggles to figure out what happened with Beverly, State Trooper Mitchell, uh, played by Art Hindle, enters the hospital to collect James after discovering a bloody scene at the farmhouse. Daniel goes outside to call in Beverly's death from his patrol car. But he's confronted by these cultists with these white shrouds with these black triangles in the center of their faces who stab him. He manages to return to the hospital as the cultists surround the building. Uh, Daniel Mitchell rushes into James's room when they hear him screaming. Uh, also, he was treated for his wounds earlier because he was pretty much about to bleed out. This is a pretty deep stab wound. He manages to return to the hospital. They treat his wounds. He, uh, Daniel and Mitchell rush into James's room when they hear him screaming. They find Beverly Hills, Bever Beverly Hills, a uh, Beverly's corpse has transformed into a tentacle monster. It, it, it's a really great design. It reminded me a little bit of the human cockroach hybrid uh, design from the film The Nest, because both of those uh, creature designs had a skull, a human skull as a main centerpiece. So this creature has like a human skull in the center and it's like it's all walk it walks on all fours it's got all these tentacles that are pouring out of its mouth it's a real sight to behold it is awe inspiring it's like it's a jaw dropping practical effect so this tentacled uh skull monster starts attacking people and uh, Daniel and Mitchell they rescue James and they lock Beverly in the room uh in the lobby uh, Vincent and Simon enter and hold a group at gunpoint, demanding to get to James. Uh, James takes Maggie hostage to protect himself and stabs Powell in the neck, who falls to the floor. The creature emerges from Beverly's room and devours Mitchell. Uh, Vincent and Simon kill the creature with fire axes and regroup with the others in the lobby. Uh, Vincent and Simon accompany Daniel to retrieve a shotgun from a patrol car. Uh, while Allison ventures into the basement to collect medical supplies for delivering Maggie's baby. 
Uh, Powell rises from the ground and captures Allison. On discovering that Allison is missing, Daniel and Vincent search for her and find photographs and files indicating that Powell was the cult's leader. Powell phones Daniel, taunting him, and mentions the vision he experienced while unconscious. This is where the film starts to slow down in terms of its pacing for me. It just gets a bit talky. It gets to moments where there isn't really a lot going on. It's trying to focus on this sort of drama and strife that's going on in the hospital with the people who were there. But it just doesn't come across as anything that intriguing to me or that captivating. Unlike the sort of paranoia horror aspects of John Carpenter's The Thing, where it's like, who's the thing? Who is it? You know, I didn't really feel any of that paranoia here. It felt manufactured. It just, the drama just didn't feel real to me. And it just it felt like there was just a lot of scenes of characters shouting at each other, uh, but with no real emotion behind it. Now, and also previously in that scene where you have the cults, the cultists, the, uh, the people in the shrouds outside the hospital, uh, Daniel's going in to try to get his shotgun. He gets his shotgun, he shoots one with, with a shotgun, and you're thinking, okay, okay, now he has a shotgun, he's going to kick some ass. This is another problem I have with this character, Daniel. He is not a badass. He doesn't really kick ass. He more than likely licks ass. Honestly, he licks ass more than he kicks ass. And, and it sucks. Because you have a film that has a lot of potential. I love the concept of Assault on Precinct 13 meets the thing. But it blows it because... Yes, you have an action sequence later in the the basement with uh, some shotgun fun. But it's not your lead doing it. It's the mute teenager who has the shotgun and he's shooting these corpses in the head. And, and, and it just makes that whole scene where uh, Daniel went through all this trouble to risk his life and, and dawdle around and honestly take a little bit longer than he should have to get the shotgun and there's even a scene there's even a line of dialogue he says once he gets the shotgun after he shoots one of the cult members he's like i'm keeping this he doesn't keep it he hands it off to the fucking teenager and he just stands there doing jack shit in this sequence in the basement your lead just stands there looking terrified and confused while the mute teenager is doing all the work Extremely disappointing. Especially with all this build-up trying to make this character to be, uh, and, and not really intimidating, but to make him a believable hero or, or, or a believable badass. To, to make him somebody that you can take seriously, who you can believe can get things done. So... Powell phones Daniel, taunts him, mentions the vision he experienced while unconscious. Kim and Ben stay with Maggie while Daniel, Vincent, and Simon interrogate James uh, with a hammer. They're going to break his fingers with a hammer. Uh, it just The whole dynamic of this scene was off to me because previously Daniel was doing all this trying to be the opposite to Vincent and, and uh, Simon. And... Now he's joining in with them, and he's he's willing to like let uh, let them be able to smash this guy's knuckles with a hammer in order to get some information out of him. Probably because you know he stabbed the doctor in the neck earlier, but it just seems a bit abrupt for me. And sort of this just transition of this character, it just seems kind of a, a abrupt change of personality for Daniel to just all of a sudden be like, yeah fucking knock his finger off you know it just felt a little bit weird a little bit off to me so james explains that powell has the power to transform people the three men force james to come with them downstairs allison regains consciousness on an operating table where powell explains he has found a way to defy death after the loss of his daughter sarah he actually has cut off his face now uh and then powell shows allison that something now grows inside her was he trying to give her what she wanted? She always wanted to be a mother. She lost her kid, I believe, in childbirth, or it was one of those things. Um, it was a miscarriage. 
So Daniel, Vincent, Simon, and James to find a hidden area in the basement when they end up surrounded by deformed corpses back to life, brought back to life in a really phenomenal sequence. That sequence is just stunning. I mean, that's what's so frustrating about the film as well, is you have these great sequences, like the sequence in the in the basement, in this uh, hidden area, with these corpses brought back to life, with this really inspired use of red lighting, and, you know, some shotgun fun and all of this, and a really memorable shot of this corpse that gets up and stands on, does a handstand, and is walking on its hands. Uh, but those sequences... Well, they're great, like the stuff with uh, the monster earlier in the hospital and the sequences here. There really needed to be a little bit more action to tie them all together and also a stronger lead in order to make these sequences more suspenseful uh, and also a little bit more of a, of a dynamic between these characters. Uh, after a while, it just got kind of boring because these characters didn't really have a lot of back and forth with one another. I personally felt these the writing uh, by, uh, I believe, it's not even telling me who wrote the film. On uh, That's a bizarre thing. It's not telling me who wrote it on uh, Wikipedia. So somebody, somebody needs to uh, add that little, <laughs> that little note there. It's, it's written by Jeremy Gillespie and Stephen Kostansky. I personally think they should have hired another writer. Um, the punch of the to actually add some punchy dialogue, and to also really make the third act work better because that's a big problem I have with the film. But also to throw in like a little bit more action. It's it's a, a Salt of Priest of the Thirteen kind of film, and you have these people in shrouds, and there's just one thing that's done with a couple of things that are done with them. They stab the guy. He shoots one of them. That's it. You don't have a scene where they try to break in and uh, the 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 main characters have to fend for themselves and shoot them one by one. Nothing like that. That was a huge missed opportunity. I, I don't buy that the budget was too low for them not to be able to do something like that. All that it takes is just a little bit more of, you know, fake blood and uh, some blanks and some squibs, which I don't think would cost that much. So I, I really don't buy that... They could not have done that. Because that just makes the whole people in the shrouds window dressing, essentially. Uh, they, they, they don't really seem like much of a threat. At all. They're just standing out there. Or they just dis they disappear and reappear whenever the plot wants them to. And, yeah, punch your dialogue. More, you know, more back and forth with these characters. A stronger lead... And I honestly think you could have a real classic, but it just doesn't quite get there for me. Here's where you get into the third act. After the really cool scene where the corpses come back to life in the basement, uh, Maggie enters labor, Kim hesitates to perform a C-section, Ben pleads with Kim, Maggie stands up and slits his throat, revealing she's carrying Dr. Powell's child, a twist I saw coming a mile away. Although, the actress who plays Maggie, Grace Monroe, was pitch perfect when it comes to her turn from sweet, innocent, pregnant girl to creepy, psycho, uh, pregnant girl. Perfect uh, performance for that type of role. I mean, when she was smiling and everything, it was, it was absolutely just eerie. It made my, it made my skin crawl. So, she kills them, uh, Kim hides as cultists enter the building, and Maggie leaves. Yeah, the cultists enter the building, but they don't do anything. They enter the building, but nothing happens with them. Daniel finds Allison in the operating room pregnant. Looking at it again at Allison, he sees a creature with tentacles extending from, extending from her body. Powell's voice speaks to Daniel, who finally attacks his wife, muta wife's mutating remains with an axe. I think this sequence is actually up to interpretation. I viewed it as the da the uh, as uh, Daniel hallucinating. Uh, Powell was putting he was inserting images in his mind to make him think that his wife had turned into this monster. 
but in reality, she didn't. And he had uh, Daniel kill his wife. And the reason why I feel this way is because there's a scene after, you know, he grabs the axe. When he grabs the axe and he starts swinging at this creature, the camera, the, the film then cuts to a shot, a wide shot of, of the door of, of the, the room that he's in. And then it starts panning out. And it starts zooming, not panning, it starts zooming out. And red blood splatters on the glass on the door. And it looks like human blood. I don't really know if that creature that you saw, which is just a mass of tentacles, is going to bleed human blood. So that's why I th that I interpret it as he killed his wife because Dr. Powell was playing mind games. Which is a pretty sadistic thing. I could totally see Dr. Powell doing something like that. Uh, Dr. Powell, to me, comes across as a, a Frank from Hellraiser type, and I, I like to call him Space Age Frank, or I, actually I like to call him a Acid Trip Frank, because that's really what he is. When you finally see his final transformed form in the, in the final act, in, in the climax, which is unbelievably anticlimactic, because Daniel, after he kills his wife, He's transported to a morgue room with a glowing black triangle on the wall. Powell tells uh, Daniel that he found the ability to conquer life and death. Powell promises that Daniel can have his child back if he is willing to die first. Um, this is where you get the overall uh, plot thread, you know, the final plot thread, the explanation for what's going on. But it's in this really muddled monologue from uh, Acid Trip Frank. And it doesn't really register that well. And it feels like it's it was really rushed by the writers. It, it just feels really just tacked on. It's just like, oh, you're just going to explain shit with a monologue. I really would have preferred if the film showed me this type of stuff instead of told me. I think it would have been a lot more effective. Uh, and And the whole explanation still doesn't make that much sense to me. Like, why are, who are these people in these shrouds? Who are these people? They're cultists. I get it. But who, what cult? Uh, the, the doctor's cult? Okay, how did this cult form? Why are these people here? Why are people turning into monsters? Just because he can turn them into monsters? Uh, I understand he made a deal with some old god like Cthulhu to have the ability to bring back his daughter, but in turn it transforms him, and then he, he doesn't really ever bring back his daughter. The whole scene, it's all built up to him having uh, his daughter reborn back from the dead uh, in the body of Maggie. and But he ends up, Maggie ends up getting pregnant. And another monster that we saw earlier in, in the hospital pops out of her instead. And it's not, it's not his daughter. And he goes in and he even says a line of dialogue. The doctor's like, oh, my daughter. Is that your daughter? So, I mean, honestly, I think the film would have been more effective if you didn't have another monster pop out of her. Instead, how about you have uh, his daughter actually get born fully grown? But there's something wrong with her. Like, she's clearly messed up or something. Or, you know, she's got black eyes or something's not right. I would have preferred that over just another monster. And it wasn't even a different design. It was the same design of the monster we saw earlier. And admittedly, it's impressive, and it's, it's, it's a nice effect, but I, I just thought that was like, really? All of this buildup, all this whole, I want my daughter back, and he doesn't really do that. And I guess all he does is unleash this plague of monsters upon the earth. So, Maggie appears, okay, before Maggie gives birth, she actually stabs Daniel in the back with a knife. And so that's where you have this just awkward scene where Powell appears without any skin, like an acid trip Frank. He stands in front of the triangle. Maggie kneels before him. Powell recites an incantation before the triangle. And Maggie's torso explodes. She bursts a reborn Sarah which is just another monster. It's not really his daughter. Uh, Vincent and Simon arrive to battle the beast. The creature envelops Vincent, but he covers it in alcohol. 
allowing Simon to kill them both with a flare. Simon Powell begins transforming. He tells Daniel he can be with Allison if he gives himself to the abyss. Uh, and yeah, it was this whole final climactic sequence and your lead is just laying there with a knife in his back while your, your villain, uh, your antagonist is just pontificating for what feels like forever. And then finally he gets up, he grabs the ax and this is, this is meant to be like his final act. And, and he just like goes in and just, ugh. he takes the ax and just puts it in his shoulder just weakly stabs it in his shoulder and that's it he doesn't go for a decapitation he doesn't try to stab the axe right in into his head no just a little bit in the shoulder which doesn't do shit and then all this terror all this horror ends rather conveniently with just uh Daniel just tackling Powell into the portal into the void and then the void closes up. I'm like, when that moment happened, I was like, what? What the hell? Really? It was that easy? Just kick his ass into the fucking void and the void closes? What kind of logic is that? I don't understand. That's how you close the void? You just knock somebody in it? I, I don't... That didn't make any sense. It just seemed convenient and lazy and completely uninspired and a terrible way to end the film there's no explosion there you know there's that other monster that gets killed but there's not really a lot of impact because it's just the same design as before and it's supposed to be the daughter but it really isn't so what was the whole point of the mad doctor making a deal with Cthulhu's brother for uh, the, the resurrection of his daughter what the fuck was the point of that Oh, oh, the whole thing is that he's so demented now that, okay, it's a monster, but he thinks it's his daughter. Whatever. It just doesn't really work that well for me. And to make matters even worse, the creature pursues, there's another creature that pursues Simon, who escapes back to the hospital and reunites safely with, with Kim. Uh, and then the movie ends with a shot that is absolutely ripped out of Lucio Fulci's The Beyond. It's almost the exact same ending. And that honestly pissed me off. Because I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, it's the same fucking ending. It, the only thing that's different is that they're in a void. with They're in, like, some void with a black triangle in the sky. Other than that, it's a similar uh, environment that they're stuck in. It, and there are also very similar shots of the reveal of what the situation that they're in. Allison and Daniel are now trapped in this void. And then the movie ends. And I'm like, what the fuck did I just watch? Why? Why? What? 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 What the hell? So, I mean, that's the thing. It's so frustrating to me. It's this final act. This third act. I mean, you had some pacing problems in the second act and so on. Maybe a little bit of a, bit of a slow starter. But the third act is what really brought the film down for me. I thought it was weak. Other than the what I consider the little sequence in the basement with the shotgun fun. I consider that to be a the, part of the second act. The third act with the monologuing and the portal and, and the lame climax where the lead just tackles the villain into tackles acid trip frank into the into the void and it closes and the two characters that honestly i really didn't care i cared the less of, i cared the less about they're the ones that are the survivors everything's up in the air uh allison and and daniel are in stuck in some void where's where did acid trip frank go is he dead I have no fucking clue. The film doesn't let you in on that. And what is up with what's going to happen now? Is the whole world going to be populated by these monsters? What's going on with these cultists? Is Kim and, and uh, are Kim and Simon going to make it out alive? I mean, it's just one of those films. Just like, uh. is it? It's not terrible or anything. It's just a movie that definitely is is a little bit of a letdown. Because the screenplay needed some work. 
It needed a touch up. It needed re a rewrite. It needed more writers. And uh, yeah, I honestly wish this film had a bigger budget as well, because then it could have done even more. And that's really too bad. But they did, they did a lot with the low budget. And yeah, from a technical standpoint, everything about this film is really good. But from a storytelling standpoint, it's 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 run of the mill. It's in the middle for me. And at some points, it's so confusing and so muddled that the story and the script kind of suck. To be perfectly honest. To be frank. But, yeah, I don't know what else to say about the film. I talked your ear off long enough. I know it's over 40 minutes. I, I didn't mean it for, the, for this review to be that long. But, um, like I said, I had some things I wanted to get off my chest. And, and I, in order to do that, I had to go through the plot. Uh, scene by scene. So, yeah. Anyway, I don't know what else to say about The Void, except if I was in rate out of five stars. Like I said earlier, I think it's an alright film. I'll give it three out of five. Um, but, I mean, yeah, a better script, a better story, a little bit better pacing, a couple more action sequences, a stronger, more charismatic lead, and uh, a less confusing and less disappointing climax. And I do feel that this could have been a modern classic, but as it is, it just isn't there. It just, just, just isn't quite up to that level but anyway that's my thoughts on the void um as always thanks for watching and i will see you guys later see ya